As we all know, this uh, coming Thursday, our nation will be observing Veterans Day. And each year, we spend time during an adjacent Shabbat service to honor our veterans and to express our gratitude for their service and dedication to the United States of America. So at this time, I would like to turn the proceedings over to Carol Weinshell, who will preside over a, a special segment of our service today to honor our veterans. Carol? Thank you, Rabbi. Um, first of all, I want you to know that I'm overwhelmed with the turnout here and on Zoom. And I'm going to tell you what the process will be so nobody is wondering what's going on. I have some remarks I'm going to make. We're then going to hear from our folks who are present in Friend Hall, and I'm going to ask them to um, state the veteran, unless they are the veteran, when they served, where they served, what branch. And then I'm going to invite the Zoomers to do the same thing. And I'm going to ask you to keep it as brief as you can, because today we have a very special guest who you will hear from at the end of this presentation. So I'd like to leave as much time as I can for Irving. For those of you who are coming up and talking about your veterans and for whatever reason, don't have all of the information I ask committed to memory, because that's something that I'm very accustomed to, as you all know. I have a cheat sheet up here for you. So with that said, you know what my plan is, and now I'll begin. Veteran Shabbat is a day when we can honor our own members who have served and defended our country in years past. More often than not, it is the veteran who says, I need no thanks. I was merely doing my job. While doing some research, I learned that there have been many more of our members who served our country going back to World War I. Hence, my scarf. For those of you who are wondering why I'm not wearing a flag scarf, the poppy is the sign of World War I. And when I was in Washington at the World War I Memorial, the World War I scarf. So interestingly enough, I found a plaque on the Bema with this inscription dating back to the time of this building. This ark is dedicated in grateful remembrance of those who have given their lives in defense of our country. I thought long and hard about the meaning of Veterans Day and knew in my heart that we would honor as many as we could reach, either by welcoming their families or themselves on Zoom or in person. It is just one small gesture that Rod of Sholem could pay tribute and say thank you. In 1910, Theodore Roosevelt gave one of his most famous speeches, The Man in the Arena, and I believe it is worthy of sharing today. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out the, how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst 
if he fails, at least fails while, while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. In 1919, President Wilson commemorated the first armistice, armistice day with these words. To us in America, the reflections of Armistice Day will be filled with solemn pride in the heroism of those who died in the country's service and with gratitude for the victory, both because of the thing from which it has freed us and because of the opportunity it has given America to show her sympathy with peace and justice in the Council of Nations. Words from two of our presidents who recognize the importance of our veterans. As such, we honor veterans today from both our Rota Sholem family and extended family. They deserve our respect, our thanks, and our utmost appreciation. It is due to their service and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms we hold dear. There's a plaque on the table where the kiddish will be that's very poignant. It's in my kitchen. When you walk by, take a look at it. But I'd like to read you something by George Skypeck, the definition of a soldier. I was that which others did not want to be. I went where others feared to go and did what others failed to do. I asked nothing from those who gave nothing and reluctantly accepted the thought of eternal loneliness should I fail. I have seen the face of terror, felt the stinging cold of fear, and enjoyed the sweet taste of a moment's love. I have cried, pained, and hoped, but most of all, I have lived times others would say were best forgotten. At least someday, I will be able to say that I was proud of what I was, a soldier. So every person here, every veteran has a story, unique, heartwarming, and memorable. But today, we only have time to hear the brief facts. So I'm going to ask you now to come forward. I'll call your name so you know the order that I'm trying to keep. And I'll ask you to state the person, what their job was, when they served, and what branch. And if I don't have somebody here, but I was asked to do it, then I will give the name myself. So I'm going to start with Mort Bernstein. Mort was a technician, commonly called a sergeant. He was in the army and he served in World War II. Dorothy, would you come up and tell us about Richard, please? And following Dorothy, will be Debbie Bowles for Stanley Carp. And following Debbie will be Mike Fleischer, just so that we can try to keep it going. Okay, so you know what Richard did, it's all you. Okay, uh, my husband, Richard Blank, he was a veteran of World War II, he was a what he called a lowly soldier. And he served in the occupation forces and he was in Japan for about a year and a half. Uh, he was happy to serve, but he was more than happy to come home. Thank, Thank you, you, Dorothy. Debbie? This is okay, I'm um, Stanley Carp, Army Reserves, 1966 to 1972 and we remember him uh, at all of our services this year. Leo Fisher, he was a staff sergeant in World War II, and 
Irving Fleischer was a corporal in World War II from 1944 to 1945. So would you just tell us who Leo Fisher was? Leo Fisher was my uncle, my sister's uncle. Okay. Oh, thank you. I'm trying to be quick here. Yeah, I, I hear you. David, um, Ryan, Giselle, do you want to, uh, I'm going to talk about your brother at the end, okay? Michael Carpolo, you're going to follow David Goldstein. I'm speaking for my father, Melvin Goldstein. Uh, he was a veteran of World War II. He served in the European theater all over Europe. He was a captain. Uh, he was cited for <coughs> honorable deeds, and he always carried his Jewishness with him. Thank you, David. <coughs> Michael? Rabbi, you're going to follow Michael. I was in the uh, Air Force in 1969, and I served Plattsburgh, New York at a SAC base. That's Strategic Air Command. And then I was transferred because by requirement, they say you have to um, pick a spot, Far East or New York, to continue. So I got assigned to uh, Ramstein, Germany, a transportation specialist. And I forgot to mention, I was also a photographer when I was in Plattsburgh, New York. Same time I worked for the local paper as a photographer. So that's it, right? Thank you, Michael. So my, my father, uh, Marshall Eisenberg, uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, served in the United States Army in World War II uh, and was a technician in the Army, uh, never fought on the front lines or anything like that, but still gave up three years of his life uh, to serve in the Army. And my uncle Joe, Joe Eisenberg, my father's older brother, also served in the United States Army. Um, and both of them were mostly located during the war in Southeast Asia and in India. Just very quickly, because I know we have several people. I will say that when my father was uh, dying in uh, 2013, in ho he was in hospice in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. And a very powerful moment during those last days of his life happened when uh, two men who were part of a veterans organization must have known that my father served in the war, came to visit my father. My father never talked very much about his service because, again, he didn't fight necessarily for his country, but he gave up three years of his life. And when these two men came to see my father, it was a really very proud moment for my father. And even from his hospice bed, he was able to find the strength to salute the two men who had come to visit him. So it was a very powerful and moving moment for our family. Thank you. Rhonda, thank you for jumping in because I did not have your grandfather on my list, but I will put him on. So, um, Billy, you're going to go after Rhonda. Okay. My grandfather, uh, Sidney Rubin, was a uh, private first class from World War II. He served in the Army Air Force. He was very proud. He was very proud American and very proud to serve. He was a meteorologist at the time during World War II. Thank you. Um, I will get that information from you after Shabbat. This is what we want to see right now. So, uh, first of all, my wife Lisa's, who's uh, not feeling well today, but she. She filled me in that her father, Charlie Margolin, um, he served in the Navy. Towards the end of the war, he was too young to actually participate in, in any uh, combat, so he had a desk job. Um, my father, Norman, was a ROTC, he, Reserve Officer Training Corps in college, so he started uh, his service in the Army as a second lieutenant. He got a field commission 
uh, as a captain when in Europe uh, he was in charge of uh, about 125 guys uh, who were driving trucks, delivering fuel as part of the Red Ball Express to Patton's army. He never uh, talked much about his service at all, <clears throat> even when asked. He was uh, typically humble about everything, but he did have a sense of humor, and he had some funny stories to tell. Thank you. Um, I, Mike Gelber, um, Nettie asked me if I would share Mike with you. Mike served in the Navy in World War II. He was on a ship out of California. Did I say, do I have it all? Okay, Debbie, will you do um, the Schwartzes? And Jill, you after Debbie. Okay, um, William Schwartz and Herman Schwartz. I don't know as much about Herman, but okay. William Schwartz um, was Army World War II a cousin. Actually, it's coming up to a year anniversary of his passing. He was married in the synagogue. And the one thing about William Schwartz is when you walk out of the library, as you're go um, going into the hallway, there's an aerial picture of Rod of Shalom. And he took the picture from a helicopter. You could tell it was many years ago, the way the trees are, and it's signed. So um, that's hanging uh, on the wall upstairs in the hall. Did you know? Did you have another Schwartz? Too? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it. Um, okay. Larry, come along. And Jill, come on, just so you're waiting. Yes, I'm speaking to honor my. I don't think it's on. Don't say that. I'll take care of it. Keep going. I'm speaking to honor my brother, Bernard Franklin Shire. Um, he served on the USS Mitcher, which was a guided missile destroyer, uh, mostly stationed in the Caribbean, uh, also in Norfolk, Virginia. This was the late 1960s. Um, and I think they even put in at Guantanamo Bay for a while. So he was a US Navy and Naval Reserve. And um, as I recall, he was in something to do with radio communications. Thank you, Larry. Jill? William Aaron, who was the son of Frida and Philip Aaron, who died at age 20 in Europe. He was in the army and there's a stained glass window upstairs uh, commemorating his death. And he was raised here. I will get that information from you after. Um, okay, so I have names um, that I, oh, Edith. Edith. My husband, Arthur Winnick. Hello, here. My husband, Arthur Winnick, he fought in World War II. He was a private uh, in 1944-45, and he was, uh, uh, he fought in the Battle of Belgium. Belgium. Thank you. If you're wondering about the order, I was trying to go alphabetical by the presenters. So that's why Edith seemed to fall out of line. Um, but it's okay because I'm not going to neglect anybody. Um, Sai, Judy, you'll you'll come after Sai. Okay. Okay. So um, my brother Joseph Leo served in the army during World War II. He served in the um, Coast Guard artillery and stationed in Virginia. He was actually married at the time, and uh, he was under the Sullivan Act, uh, head of household, so he wasn't shipped overseas because he was the head of the house of my father and passed away. And uh, his one story he told was that he actually fired at a German U-boat that entered and filtrated our waters. And they, and they shot this boat and they could see the swastika as it went down. So that was his thing. I served in the army during the Korean War in 1951-53. Uh, I spent one year stateside uh, with advanced infantry training and went overseas. I spent seven months in Korea and Busan. Uh, I, um, I, I guess uh, I was a squad leader of a light machine gun squad. Uh, we came very close to going to combat, but 
God intervened and saved me, and we did not go after all, but it was very close, let me say that. Uh, so I, I, I was protected by God, I know I was. Thank you. Thank you, Sly. Judy? My husband, Pierre, served in the National Guard. He was in a medic unit in New Haven on Goth Street. Um, it was 1966. It was the height of Vietnam. It was a scary time. Uh, we were just married. When he did his basic training, I went to visit him at Fort Benning in Georgia, and I was pretty shocked. Um, on the base, there were bathrooms that said Negroes only, and other bathrooms that said whites only. And as we walked by them, I remember Peter saying to me, don't say anything, just keep walking, just keep walking. Uh, it was pretty shocking to me to see that uh, on an army base where people were giving their lives for the country to be segregated like that. I also want to recognize my father, Jack Kisselstein, who was in the Navy during World War II. Several uncles also were in the Navy during World War II. Stanley Kisselstein, Ruben Kisselstein, and Bill Joseph. And also, my uncle Ben Kisselstein was in the Army in World War II. Thank you, Judy. I have some names that are related to me and some that are not before we do the Zoomers. Henry Diamond, who you all know, was a technician three. He, Henry would not talk about his service. He was in World War II, and I do remember him coming to visit my father when my mom died and he sat on the porch in tears. Um, and it stuck with me for ever, really. Gene Feidelson was an uncle of mine. He was in the army, spent quite a bit of his time as a POW in Germany, World War II. Um, Mel Gerlich asked me to talk about his father, Martin Gerlich. He was a technical sergeant who landed in Marseille, France in 1944. His division fought in France and Germany. He was stationed in Stuttgart. His Yiddish came in handy for him. He was in the army, the 100th division, and he served from 1943 to 1946. I told you about Mike Gelber. Abe Green was World War II. He was in the army He was from 1943 to 1946. I believe he was a medic. You have it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Uh, uh, Lawrence Ostrovsky was in the army and he was stationed in the Pacific in World War II. The story he shared with me was in order to keep the soda cold, it was tied onto the ship and dropped into the water. He was on the ship, he was in the army. Um, Dave Rankin is my brother-in-law, Marge's husband. He was in the finance corps in the army during um, the Vietnam era, and he served in Vietnam. Theodore Spivak was an uncle of mine, my father's brother. He was in the army, World War II, served mostly in Africa as a dentist. Jack Weinberger was my mother's brother who served in the Caribbean in the Navy in World War II, and he fell in love with St. Thomas Virgin Islands, which is where he ultimately settled and died, not while in service. Nathaniel Weinshell was Mike's father. He was in the Navy. He managed equipment and clothing and served in Oklahoma from 1943 to 1946. Austin Wolf was in the Marines. He joined the day after Pearl Harbor at age 18. He was on the battleship South Dakota and honored a number of times here in locally. Um, Marty Wolf was in Japan, he, the first CAV division. And he was very quick to tell me that he was the first bar mitzvah after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, I did Arthur Winnick, Joseph, okay. Um, 
On my personal list, the last two are Captain Randy Weinshell. Randy was in the Dental Corps and he served in Iraq during Iraqi freedom. And Matthew Weinshell, Colonel Matthew Weinshell, who just retired, was in the Army from 1995 until this past um, June. And his branch was aviation, regular Army and special forces. So now I'm going to flip over to the Zoomers. And I'm going to ask the Zoomers, as I call your name, if you would unmute and then remute. And let's see if we can make this happen. Um, Glenn Germain, would you tell us about your dad? Sure, um, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, my father, Thomas Germain, enlisted in the, in the Army upon graduation from high school in 1941. And he served in the Pacific Theater, primarily Philippines and New Guinea, um, was a technical sergeant. Um, he didn't talk so much about, about his experience in, in World War II, although, it was obviously a very formative experience in, in his life. Um, and I just wanted to mention um, my uncles who also served in the army in World War II, uh, Harold Kaufman, George Kaufman and Leonard Kaufman. My great uncle David Kaufman was in the Navy in World War II and great uncle Harry Germain was a private in the army in World War I. So thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn. Leon Gould. I served in the Army from 1956 to 1958, primarily in Germany. In the 3rd Army Division Combat Command had headquarters of the Specialist Four. Okay, thank you. Um, Jim Grutzmacher. And for those of you who don't know, Jim is Sarah Layden's husband. Yes, but I have, okay. <laughs> I'm Jim Grossmacher and I'm a Marine. I served in the Marine from 65 to 69. And um, I was in Vietnam. If somebody needs whoever that is. Yeah, just turn the off now. And um, served in Vietnam for- Jim, hold uh, on one years. second. Yeah. If you're not speaking, please mute yourself. I just did. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and Jim. Anyway, I, I served for a little over a year in Vietnam and uh, was in basically combat constantly for the uh, whole 13 months, but came home unscathed. And uh, I still meet once a year with several uh, Marines that I was in combat with. We have a reunion every year. That's it. Thank you, Jim. Um, Rusty Miriam. Uh, you know. Can you unmute Rusty or do you, Sharon, can you unmute Rusty? I can't see. For some reason I can't, I can ask her. Uh, she just did it. Oh, wait. Okay. Yeah, she's Thank got you. it, she's good. Uh, Rusty, you were unmuted. Now you're muted again. Okay, I'll do it. She's doing now, now she's unmuted. You're unmuted, okay. Rusty. Thank you. Uh, my husband, Sidney Madwood, uh, joined the Army Air Force right out of high school, and he served as a pri private and was in being trained to be a pilot. Uh, his brother Jack was a captain in the army and served in the Battle of Normandy. His brother Albert, our bud, was in the U.S. Navy and he was in the submarine service. And brother-in-law Erwin Hausen was a sergeant, served in the Pacific Theater of War and had several Purple Hearts. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Rusty. Rabbi Nelson. Thank you, Carol, for this inspiring program and inviting me to talk about my father, who from 1942 to 1946 took leave of Rosalem and served in the, cap in the rank as captain uh, as the uh, chief chaplain of Fort Dix uh, in New Jersey, uh, which meant that we uh, went with, we went as far as New York. We moved to New York to be uh, close, uh, closer. And he returned in 1946, and uh, the congregation welcomed him back. And it's all in that beautiful Centennial Gala uh, history that was so beautifully done. And uh, so uh, I'm proud that you invited me. And I'm also very honored to be part of the Royal Shalom family. And I kept it within a minute. Thank, Thank you. you um, Mike Passo. Hi. Uh, I served in the Army from uh, 69 to 72. Uh, I served in Vietnam for a year in a combat union and also in an aviation unit. Okay, my dad, Abraham Passo, also served in the U.S. Army, and he was a medic during World War II, and he went over on the Liberty ships bringing the troops back. Uh, my father-in-law, Sam Kotzen, also served in the U.S. Army as a, in an engineering unit. And... Uh, Four or five years ago, we observed all the pictures that he had taken while he was there, and he went. He was in Dachau when they liberated it. Um, I just want to mention to all you U.S. Army guys, the new museum down at Fort Belvoir. I don't know if you've seen this. Just open again. It's a brand new Army museum. I don't know if anybody's aware of it. All I have Thank to say. You. Thank you, Mike. Um, Stanley Richard. I uh, served in the uh, uh, New York State National Guard for six years from 1963. Are you? We're losing. 1969. Uh, we had New York City. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, New York City blackout. And uh, my unit. Oh, Stanley, you're coming in and out. Called up to service uh, hospitals. Uh, uh, in 1965, I was called up during the New York City blackout to work on uh, critical infrastructure that was down due to the electric power grid failure. Thank you, Stanley. Larry Sachs. Um, I served uh, during the Korean conflict, 1951 to 1953. Uh, I remained stateside. Uh, I was doing auditing work, auditing government contracts with the defense contractors. Thank you. Thank you. Next on my list, don't ask me to explain the alphabetical order of who's doing what. I didn't put the responsible person was my father, Leon Spivak. Sue was probably wondering, how did you leave out dad? Um, uh, my father trained what they call the 90 day wonders on Miami Beach to prepare them to be officers and be deployed. And that was in World War II. Um, Ross Stein. You have to unmute, Ross. Uh -oh. Okay. Okay, we can hear you. Okay, I'm representing my husband, Rabbi Israel Stein, who served in the Army from 1964 to 66 in Fort Huachuca, Arizona, where they were testing the drones that Amazon is now using. Thank you, Roz. Um, Debbie, you have... Um, our, our own Willie Cuevas' father, Ulysse Cuevas, Korean War vet, 3rd Infantry, 1950 to 1953. Thank you. Ernie. Okay. 
Hi, I was drafted in 1951 during the Korean War. The president was Harry S. Truman. I served in Germany and I was a TINE officer. That stands for Troop Information and Education. I gave weekly lectures to three to 600 men at one time. As you can see, I wasn't bashful at all. <laughs> the army gave me a, a booklet of 10 pages and from there I had to talk to the three to 600 men and these topics could be anything from being friendly with the German people, converting money, being a good soldier and what to, to stay healthy and of course be very careful of venereal disease. So, and uh, that was it. <laughs> oh, by the way, I sold my house in Fairfield in one day. That's it. Thank you, Ernie. Now, before I conclude the Zoomers, is there anybody who has a veteran or is a veteran who I didn't recognize? If you are, um, I just want to finish the Zoomers so I can see them. Is there anybody on Zoom? Yes, missed? Carol. Carol? Hey, yes? I'm sorry, I would like to, I'd be remiss if I did not mention my family. So I am here to honor my father, Ephila Pensack, who was a member of Road of Shalom and left uh, Pennsylvania where he was born to go to New York to volunteer in World War I. He was a member of the very famous 365th Division, which was lost, the Lost Battalion. My brother, Aaron Pensack, was in World War II. He was first in the Air Force. They transferred him to the Army because the Air Force was at that time part of the Army. And he was at the Battle of the Bulge and later at, well, first at the D-Day Normandy invasion. My sister, Betty, was a wave. She used to go to the recruiting office all the time because her eyesight was terrible and she could not pass the test. Finally, finally, she was 2020 and she was sent to uh, Bethesda, Maryland because she was a dental hygienist. Thank you, Debbie. Anybody else on Zoom? Okay. Yeah, I would like to uh, introduce my friend, Mark Cohen, Dr. Mark Cohen, who just moved from California uh, to Milford, Connecticut, and uh, visiting us today. And we welcome you back to Connecticut. We grew up with Mark. Billy and I graduated with Mark in 1970 from Andrew Ward High School, but Mark was much smarter than both of us and got better grades. <laughs> uh, you're exaggerating. Um, uh, yeah, so um, let's see. Uh, my uncle Herbert served in the army in the early 1950s at the Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland. My uncle Sheldon was a psychologist and a captain, served in the army for most of the 1950s in Oklahoma at Fort Sill. My uncle Paul uh, uh, was a math and accounting whiz, uh, but the Navy in their infinite wisdom state, trained him as a cook and stationed him at uh, Treasure Island uh, during World War II, Treasure Island, San Francisco. My father, uh, enlisted early in 1942 in the Army Signal Corps and uh, went over to England early with a radar unit in uh, early 1943. And the English wouldn't let them use their radar sets because it interfered with theirs. Uh, he landed on Omaha Beach, was in combat at Omaha Beach at St. Lowe, um, he was bombed by the 8th Air Force, 
uh, and woke up in a hospital in England a week later. And then in what I always considered a, a big question mark about his sanity, he was given a choice of, leave, of quitting the army and going home or rejoining his unit, and he rejoined his unit, which got him uh, later to the liberation of Paris, Battle of the Bulge, and he was with the uh, force that counterattacked at Bastogne. At the crossing of the Rhine, he was bombed again, this time by the Luftwaffe, and ended up back in the hospital. And that was pretty much the end of his army career. Thank you for sharing. So um, before I introduce our guest speaker, I have homework for all of you that I'm sure you will not be surprised at hearing. I do not have all of the information that you folks who are in the room and you folks are on Zoom have provided. I have some. Please email and share it with me. If you don't give it to me, it's lost and you give me a very big job of doing research. So I found a lot of this in walking the cemetery and um, I need your help. So now that I've given you an assignment, saving the very best for last, we will have the opportunity to hear from Irving Glazer, our centenarian, who will share some of his memories of D-Day, as is so typical of the World War II vets. Irving told me to just write his story. You don't have to honor me. I was doing my job. There will be no doubt in your minds that celebrating Irving Glazer is not only the right thing to do, but the honorable thing to do, as we all take pride in him. Irving, this is your time. Technical difficulties. Yes, no. Take your time. We'll have more. Give me one more. That's over here. Yeah, we don't want anybody falling on the side. Yes, no? Cheers, no. There we go. If you hold it, it would be better. Oh, okay. I'll get it. I got it. I got it. Okay. Do you want me to hold this? Because my hand shakes with the best of them. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you better hold it. Yeah. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Yeah. I'd like to say, first of all, my thanks to Rabbi Eisenberg, Cantor Hirsch, who I haven't seen here and President Debbie Bowles for relinquishing the puppet this morning. I have a special thank you to Harold Wanchell for remembering all the veterans and planning such a wonderful event. Veteran Shabbat gives us the opportunity to tell our stories beyond the family dinner table, which what I usually do. <coughs> now, I'm going to keep this as short as possible because I don't want to take up any more of your time. So I will go with saying that my training in the state, I was trained as a demolition specialist, which included 
mines and explosives. And after three months of that training, I was sent over to England and the camp where my outfit was the 531st Engineer Shore Regiment. And we went to two dry runs of evasions. The second one, we were attacked by German snubbles or e-boats. We lost over a thousand people in that attack. <clears throat> On June 2nd, we got notice to everybody to report to the mess hall for a special review. And we were told at that time that we were going to be boarding a ship on June 3rd. On that, before we can get on the ship, we had orders to make sure we had no identification on us. We were to leave our duffel bags there. They will bring it back to us in about two days. They never told us what the day was for the invasion. But we were told to take two changes of underwear, two changes of socks, a regular uniform fatigue, work uniform, and to be sure that you left no identification. The only identification I was allowed to have were my dog tags. That time, uh, that came on June 2nd and June 3rd, we were taken over to the ship and loaded on, and we had at least 2,000 GIs on that ship. On the 3rd, we were told that the invasion would be on the 5th. And we all were told to put on our equipment on June 4th. And uh, whatever equipment that you had, you had to have on your body. I had bullets, cartridges, demolition uh, explosives, 40 pounds. I had my almost 75 pounds of equipment on me. And we, on the morning of June 5th, we were taken up on board and put in line, and we had to climb down the rope sheeting like to get into the landing craft. The landing craft held about 30 soldiers. And we took off and we get into the channel and all of a sudden word comes down that the invasion has been postponed because they expecting a storm and the Air Force would not be allowed to fly. So we had to turn around and go back. While we were waiting, they gave us some food and I, most of the guys were sick. They were hanging over the rail, their heads. They were sick. I could have been in the Navy. I didn't get sick. But while I was eating some of my food, one of the GIs comes up to me next to me and says, well, what are they serving here? I says, well, I'll tell you what. You stand next to me here, and when you see a tray go by that you think you like, grab it. <laughs> He just ran and walked away and I said, goodbye. Then the word came down that the weather looks like it's going to be good for the sixth. Prepare yourself for the landing of the sixth. So sure enough, on the morning of the sixth, we all got dressed and were taken on board on top. And we had to climb down rubber net, uh, rope netting to get into the landing ship. Now, the, the landing boat that I went into held 30 GIs, and we were going, as we left, we went into what we found out, they called Piccadilly Circles, and it, we were supposed to be the first board once on shore, the first wave on shore, and we kept going around, and finally, I guess they get a signal, okay, you can now go in. And it, we, it was stormy weather, the water was rough, current was strong, 30 guys in the boat, and they're all sick. 
the time of them were looping into their helmets and then taking the helmet over, over the surface of the ship uh, in the water and having the helmet wash out and put it back on. But all of a sudden, we're going along and the ship stops, the front drops, and we all have to jump out. And when I jumped out, I had a gas mask that hung around my neck. And I hit the water, I landed into water about so high. The gas mask hit me in the face, knocked my rifle off my shoulder. So I'm standing there, shells coming from all over bullets. And I'm standing there trying to find my rifle. And I couldn't find it. So my sergeant, in good and nice language, says, Glazer, get your body over there on the, on the shore. I want to see you on the shore. Okay, so all I could do was shells coming over, off on the cliff on the left, Germans were shooting down, off on the right, on the shore, the bunkers, machine guns were shelling us, and we were running along, trying to hide. What happened, they dropped us off at high tide, when we should have been dropped off at low tide, but they couldn't because the Germans had mounted uh, different mines and things into the water so if the boat would go anywhere it's near them, they would be torn apart or blown apart. And in fact, as we came down, we saw a, one of the ships bent, turned over and the GIs there hollering, help, help. And we started to holler, stop, stop, save them, stop. The Navy man that was guiding us said, I can't. I have orders not to stop. I got 30 guys here in this boat and I can't sacrifice the 30. And he just, I just have to keep going. But as it was, when we got onto to shore, one of the lieutenants told us that there were people there, they were saved because they had sent out a rescue boat to pick them up. And that wasn't the first time that boats go along with and there's floating mines in the water. We get on shore, at least I did by diving and hiding behind the uh, obstacles, I was able to get on shore. And I had 40 pounds of explosive on me, but my sergeant came up and said, we need that, the Germans blocked the road. And the only way to get off the beach is through that road. So they need that explosive. So I gave him that. Then he says to me, all right. He says, I want you to prepare yourself. Take the minesweeper. Get over it. Don't get over that wall. There was a brick of stone wall at the end of the beach. Don't go over there to start. Go over this side and work your way down. So that's what I did. I took the the minesweeper and was sweeping for mines. Now the Germans are very helpful with what they call bouncing Betty mines. These mines, if you step out, they're all in three crowds sticking out of the ground. If you step on them, it goes down, but nothing happens. When you move your foot off, boom, up goes the mine. And, and you'll be lucky if you don't lose both legs or yourself. Anyway, whatever we found the mine, I would have to dig it out. But as long as those three points were sticking up, the mine was safe. I could dig it out and put it aside. And one of the other fellows was walking and working down the other end, doing the same thing. Well, believe me, that first day, we picked up almost 300 mines. And the only way we would tell if there was any more, the Germans would put the mines in a certain pattern. And if you came across that pattern, the rest of the field would be the same way. But if you found them in scattered around, you're in trouble because you had to go through the whole field and do it. And usually there's a sign out there that says, Achtung, mining. But you don't know, is there or is there not mines in there? 
they can put a sign up and say there's mines or waste our whole day trying to find those mines. But anyway, it came around dusk time, it started to get dark a little bit. So Sergeant comes over and says, Glazer, that's enough for now. I want you to go down to the beach and make yourself ready for evening. He says, dig yourself a foxhole. So sure, I have my own shovel. I go down to the beach and I start digging into the sand. And I get down at about three feet and all of a sudden I hear water. So what am I going to do? There's water there. And at that time, I was about five seven. Today I'm about five feet. <laughs> but the thing I was, I didn't want to stand in the water. So I took my helmet, put it down, and stood on the helmet. And I made my talk, and I had a buddy about six feet away from me. We had a little talk, but it was starting to get dark. And all of a sudden, we hear this terrible roar. And I said, oh, oh, sounds like planes. That if it's coming from the land side, that means they're German. If it comes from the English Channel side, we're in good, good luck. And sure enough, it took about 10 minutes. And I looked up in that sky, and I saw planes that you wouldn't believe. If there wasn't hundreds, there were more. And in fact, that we got a newspaper, the Stars and Stripes, and one of the generals made a remark stating that literally anybody could walk from England to France on the back of these planes. That is a sight that was unbelievable. And I stood there and looked at it, and, and I said to myself, this is the Ramel guy that, that says if we get to the beach, we're going to be killed. He said, we'll drive in the back out of the water. They'll never make it across to Bay in Bay. And I looked at that guy, and I said, you'd think so, huh? But you're going to find out. And that was it. I went to sleep. And the next day, it was the same thing again, where we had to do some more mines. But the thing is, let's say this is a minefield. There was another space where the Germans had dug, hollowed out about three feet, and planted poles with mines on top, or sharp metal, so that when the, and filled it with water, that whole thing was filled with water. In case some parachuters came down, they would be killed or drowned as the parachutes would cover them up in that water. So that was the next, one of the next things that in the second day, we had to drain all that water and get rid of those uh, obstacles. I could tell you more stories, but I don't want to take up any more time. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kira. Uh, thank you, Irving. Amazing, Irving. So, what can I say? I I told you I was saving the best for the last. And, and you folks who have told stories all have incredible <coughs> stories. So I want to thank you all for sharing, for serving, and Irving, especially for letting us into a small corner of your life. There are some names who were not mentioned, and they were killed in active duty. And I promised that I would do that. So they are related to us. They are related to Rona Sholem. They have a connection. The first one is Lieutenant Colonel Meyer Engel, Army chaplain who was killed in Vietnam. His family has a connection to Rona Sholem. 
Giselle Glazer lost her brother, Alfred Gold, in World War II. I acknowledge my mother's brother, Herman Weinberger, who was killed during World War II, for if she were here today, she would be standing proudly remembering him and reflecting upon the impact his death had on her family. Let us also remember Coleman Ashkins, Paul Drotch, Francis Bressler, and Captain Edward Jarris. Captain Edward Jarris, you've heard my story over and over. He was the impetus for every plaque as a story. I dragged Debbie to Hebrew sick before Memorial Day, searching for Francis Bressler's grave, and we found it. Um, Paul Drotch is buried in what we call Rodeshaw Memorial Park, while Coleman Ashkins is in the old cemetery, and we found all of them. Since I do not know of others who personally lost family members while on active duty, I ask that you remember them and send me their names so we can remember. Joe? There's a uh, stained glass window dedicated upstairs to Otto Greiner. Otto Greiner was Charlotte Loeb's brother, um, and he was in the uh, Army Air Corps and died in a training accident, uh, I believe in, in Louisiana, but yes. during World War II. Will you send me that information? Because I don't have that. Okay. Okay, I would appreciate that. It's one of my mysteries. And there are many mysteries here. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming. I'm going to turn the service back over to the rabbi because it's his pulpit. Thank you, Irving, for allowing us to honor you. Thank you to the entire Green family, those here and those on Zoom, um, for sponsoring the Kiddush in Irving's honor. And thank you so much, Rabbi Eisenberg, for allowing me to take over the service this morning and supporting me as we honor the veterans. This has been a distinct honor and privilege for me. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for everyone who participated. Thank you for your service, all those who served. And with special thanks to Irving Glazer, our centenarian. Did I say it right? And may, may, he's working on the next He's working on the next. And just may God grant you continued health and strength. And may you continue to be a uh, source of such joy and nachis to your loved ones and to your family and to Rodef Shoal and your congregation and community. Thank you. Let's uh, now continue with page 151, Ashrei silently. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Living in Israel, I 